Glistening beneath the golden rays of the summer sun, the serene pond beckoned to my group of friends promising relief from the sweltering heat. Excitement bubbled within us as we splashed and played, our laughter mingling with the gentle rustling of the surrounding trees. Little did we know that this carefree day of swimming would soon turn into a hard-stopping ordeal that would forever haunt our memories. As the afternoon waned, we decided to test our courage by venturing deeper into the pond. The water turned murky and cold, an eerie contrast to the warmth of the sun above. We treaded cautiously a mixture of excitement and trepidation swirling in our chests. Laughter echoed across the water as we dared one another to swim farther from the shore. But our joy turned to dread when we realized that one of our friends, Sarah, was no longer among us. Panic swept through the group like a dark shadow, paralyzing our movements and clouding our minds. Frantically, we scanned the water, desperately calling out Sarah's name. The once inviting pond seemed to transform into a sinister abyss, swallowing our cries of distress. Fear clutched at our hearts as time stretched into eternity, our hopes for Sarah's safety slowly dwindling. Just as despair had threatened to consume us, a gasp cut through the air. A lone figure emerged from the depths of the pond, struggling to make it to the surface. It was Sarah, her face a mask of sheer terror, her strength waning with each stroke. With the surge of adrenaline, we rushed to her aid, pulling her safely onto the shore. Tears streamed down Sarah's face as she clung to us, trembling from the traumatic experience that she had endured. Her words spilled forth, recounting a harrowing tale of being pulled under by something, the suffocating pressure of the water closing in around her. She described distorted shapes lurking beneath, taunting and threatening her very existence. Relief mingled with lingering unease as we held Sarah close, realizing that something inexplicable had transpired in the depths of that pond. The once idyllic oasis now bore the scars of a hidden malevolence, its tranquil surface disguising the horrors that lurked below. In the days that followed, we couldn't shake off the lingering sense of unease. Our visits to the pond became infrequent, our minds plagued by questions that remained unanswered. What had caused Sarah's ordeal? Was it a mere accident? Or was there something far more sinister dwelling in the depths of that seemingly innocent body of water? The incident forged an unbreakable bond among our group forever uniting us through the shared experience of fear and survival. We became more cautious and more aware of the potential dangers that could lurk in places that we once considered safe. To this day, the memory of that day at the pond lingers in the recesses of our minds, a chilling reminder that even in the most familiar settings, darkness can manifest itself in unimaginable ways. We learned that day the true meaning of resilience, the strength to face our fears and emerge stronger, forever changed by the terrifying encounter that unfolded beneath the surface of the water. The pond serves as a haunting reminder of the thin veil that separates safety from danger and joy from terror. And though time may heal the wounds of that fateful day, the memory of Sarah's struggle and our collective fear will forever remain etched in our hearts, a testament to the fragile nature of our existence and the unyielding strength of the human spirit. This happened years ago, when I had gotten my first actual job. Not just babysitting or working at a family friend's restaurant and just keeping my tips. I didn't think much of it. I figured it was harmless. I could find people around the country to chat with. Learn about some other cultures, you know, all that kind of stuff. I wouldn't give out personal information about myself. No phone number, address, or any of that. I wasn't stupid. I was bored. No friends in my city. All my friends were back in my hometown. And I wanted to fill time and loneliness and talk to people. I heard about these websites to meet pen pals around the world. I made a simple profile 
stated what kind of friends I was interested in making, you know, just basic stuff. And after about a month, I received a message from a man. I don't remember it word for word, but it basically said, I, uh, I found your profile and I'm super interested in being friends. He then stated that he lives in the same state as me. Though I know maybe it was rude to be as snobby about someone in my state contacting me, I did politely say that my profile that I was trying to make some pen pals outside of the US. I responded politely though, and I replied to a few of his messages for a while. I found out that he lived in the same city as me. I see you like anime. I love anime. I also see you've been to Japan. I've been to Japan too. Do you go to anime conventions? Maybe we could go together to the next convention that comes to town. I felt a little uncomfortable. I put right on my page that I have no intention to meet up with anyone. Just have an online pen pal. I politely told him that and he didn't like it. I just thought that we could be friends since we have a similar interest. I again politely told him that I'm not interested in meeting anyone in person from the website. He pretended to be fine with it and went right back to rambling about his interests. I logged out of the website for a few days and just focused on my personal life, going to work and doing my schoolwork and taking care of my disabled father. One day, I woke up to notifications on multiple of my instant messenger apps, all stating basically the same thing. Hey, it's blank from the pen pal website. And he messaged me on like four of my chat apps, which I did not give him. How did he find it? I was really annoyed. As politely as I could, I messaged him on the pen pal website. Hey, so I don't know how you found my IDs for my chat apps, but that was kind of over the line. It wasn't really appropriate. Not one app, but you messaged me on like four of them. I'm sorry, but I really wanted to talk to you, and you haven't been on the website for a few days. That still doesn't make it okay. I also have a personal life and a job and a family. I can't spend all my time on here. Well, that's why I messaged you on those apps. I don't have them listed on my profile. How did you even find them? He avoided the subject. I'm sorry that I did that. I'm just trying to be your friend. I just want to be friends with you. Well, this isn't the way to do it. I'm very uncomfortable that you somehow found that information that I didn't even give you. I don't think that we should talk anymore. I don't want to be friends with you, I'm sorry. Please don't contact me again. I immediately blocked him on all of those apps and on the pen pal website. For a few months, everything was fine. Suddenly, I got a message on one of those apps and the user wasn't in my friends list. The message was basically as follows. You stupid idiot. No one will ever love you. You'll never find a man to love you. You're so fat and ugly. Why don't you just end yourself? Do the world a favor. I rolled my eyes and blocked the account. Throughout the course of a year, every few months across my multiple social media platforms, I was being harassed. I had completely forgotten about the man until I had received a message on the pen pal website. The account had no name or photos. It was just a random username. The message I received was the same nonsense as before, calling me fat and ugly, telling me that I should die. Once I got the message on that website, I knew that it had to be him. I had had no other issues with anyone. I replied saying that guy's name, telling him that I know that it was him and that his behavior is really sad and pathetic. I just wanted to be your friend, watch your back, and then the account blocked me. For a few more months, nothing really happened. I got maybe one or two messages from fake accounts again, but I had grown used to it and just immediately blocked them. 
And then one day, I received a Facebook message from a police officer. He was contacting me about a profile that I apparently made on a website used for people to have affairs and hookups and that kind of stuff. I had never heard of it before then, and absolutely did not have an account there. I have a long talk with him, where he told me that his department investigates humans being taken and thought that I was an underage girl possibly in danger. It had my personal Facebook account listed on the profile, as well as other ways to contact me. I was in shock. He advised me to contact the website and ask them to take down the profile, but said to me, You seem like a sweet girl. I don't know who you upset, but don't read the profile. My curiosity got the better of me, but I should have taken his advice. Using some of my normal selfies, an account was made, and the profile stated a lot of horrible things. It made me sick to my stomach to read some of the things that it said. I apparently wanted to have done to me. Thankfully, the website took quick action to take down the profile. The next time that I got one of those messages online, I snapped. I didn't hold back, yelling him out for being so immature and disgusting because someone simply didn't want to be his friend. The account blocked me without answering back. I didn't get a message from any accounts for a while. One day when I was the closer at work, I was waiting outside for a family friend to pick me up. I didn't have my own vehicle and my family would give me rides to and from work. As I was listening to music, waving goodbye to my manager as they drove off, I got a notification on one of my apps. You're ugly. I sighed, rolling my eyes as I opened the message. As I was typing, Another message came in that made me stop typing and freeze up. You're all alone now. I could take you out right now if I wanted to. No one would ever find you. I backed up against the building. I didn't have keys, only the manager did who just left. I looked around through the parking lot, not a car in sight. The streetlights shined dimly around me. My heart started to race as more messages came in. You're so ugly, you know that. No one would ever fall in love with you. Your family probably won't even miss you. I should just do it right now. I started to cry, the phone shaking in my hands. Just as another text came in, a car pulled up in front of me. It was a family member coming to pick me up. I took a deep breath and quickly got into the car. Hey, sorry I'm late. I got stuck at two red lights. Your manager already left. They just left you alone out here. Just drive. I accidentally screamed at them, tears streaming down my face. What's wrong? Did something happen at work? I was crying, shaking. They took my phone and looked at it, seeing the messages. What the heck? Who's texting you? I don't know who it is. Please, just drive though. I want to get out of here. We went back to their place and they wanted to call the police, but I told them not to. I had no idea who they were or where to find them to make a police report against them. Instead, they called another family member who works in the IT field. After they heard the old story, everything that I've endured for almost two years, they told me that I should have made new accounts from the beginning of all of this. I listened to them right then and there. I made new accounts on all my social media. I worked at that job for another month, but my family member had told my manager what had happened, so I was never put on closing shifts again. I was only given morning ones, where I clicked out of work when the sun was still out. But I still didn't feel safe. They knew where I worked at, so my manager understood when I ultimately quit. All the harassment stopped. To this day, I still haven't received any more of those messages. Now, I'm married. I still live in this city and I don't live in that neighborhood anymore. I feel comfortable. And I don't feel afraid that this person will find me and stalk me again. But even now, 
Anytime I get a random message from someone who isn't in my friends list, my heart races for a second. When I was a freshman in college in October of 2018, a guy that I'll call Ron Jones stalked me. I met Ron through one of our mutual friends, Chris, because they were in a school club together. When I met Ron, I thought he was kind of strange, but he was nice and he seemed interesting. He claimed to be Slavic and had an accent to back that up. I just thought that he might seem weird because of cultural differences. I go to school in a rural southern area, and I figured the culture shock between here and wherever he was originally from was a lot to handle. Anyway, we traded numbers and texted infrequently for a couple of weeks. On October 3rd, 2018, a friend of mine and I went to a drag show on our campus. and We weren't out super late, but it was dark when the show had ended and we began walking back to our dorm. I had been texting Ron a bit during the night because he was unable to get a ticket to the show and he wanted to know how it was. At some point in the conversation, I mentioned that I wanted to go grab some orange juice on my way back to my dorm. I don't know why I mentioned that to him. I think I was just trying to make conversation. My friend and I stopped in the convenience store near our building so I could get sad orange juice. And Ron was already there. He said something about buying the juice for me, and I thanked him but declined. He got kind of mad and he started to walk away, which was odd to me, but I let it go. My friend and I walked out of the store and saw that he was standing outside. Our dorm was actually right across from the building that the convenience store was in, so he saw us enter the building. My friend and I parted ways and I walked up to my room, which was on the second floor of the building facing the convenience store. I kick myself for doing this now, but I went to my window, opened it, and yelled down to Ron when I saw that he was still standing there. I apologized for declining his offer to buy the juice for me because I felt like I had been rude, a guilty conscious I guess. He stood below my window, starting to talking to me about random stuff, and at one point he said something that was odd. He was like, can I flirt with you? I enjoy doing that. I kind of laughed and said, uh, okay, because I had no clue how to respond to that, and just figured he was a flirtatious person. Stupid, I know, but that's not the dumbest thing that I did. I ended up going outside to sit and talk to Ron for a little bit because I felt bad for being rude earlier. As if declining someone's offer to buy you something is rude, jeez. While we were outside, he didn't say anything of note and he was acting pretty normal. It got cold out so we asked if we could go inside to talk and I said sure. At this point in the year, I had had several guy friends over to my room just to do work and chat so I didn't see an issue with it, and things started out pretty normally, but they quickly got scary. Out of nowhere, Ron basically turned into a different person when we were all alone in my room. He stopped blinking, he held eye contact super intensely, and he was laughing in this really low, creepy way. On top of that, his accent disappeared. And that's when he told me that he had lied about being Slavic, and that he's native to the state that our college is in. He got increasingly more creepy, and there was nothing that I could do about it because I had a single room my freshman year. At one point, he grabbed me in a hug and wouldn't let go of me until I said, let go of me right now, three times or so. He told me that he had done a lot of bad things and that if I wanted to put him in jail, he could give me the names of people who have evidence against him. He said that he hates pretty much everybody until they give him a reason not to hate them. He said a lot of weird and nearly sexual stuff to me as well. Like he went on and on about how showering alone isn't fun, and that it's better with another person, and that he would be willing to do that if I wanted to. Keep in mind, this guy has a girlfriend and he acknowledged that. He even said that he would go after me if he weren't dating someone, 
which freaked me out. He asked if he could sleep in my room and I said no, and I used that to tell him that I was ready for bed and that he needed to leave. As he left, he said, do you want to know how insecure the locks and your doors really are? He also pulled a few IDs out of his wallet, all with different names. I closed the door on him and looked through the people. He stood there looking at the door for an uncomfortably long time before eventually leaving. After that, he called me multiple times throughout the month, always at weird times. He started appearing everywhere that I was around campus. The friend who had introduced us, Chris, actually started walking everywhere with me because he noticed Ron following me around and lurking around corners when I couldn't see him. Apparently, he was around me a lot more than I realized because Chris began carrying a knife wherever he went places. Ron was everywhere. He would come up to me and put his arm over me and whisper stuff like, we need to talk, whenever he would see me. For a while, he would lurk outside of my dorm room, and that stopped all of a sudden one day. I later found out that Chris had told my RA about Ron, and that he had been banned from my building. I hadn't done that myself because I thought I was overreacting. I wasn't. I blocked him on my phone and he hasn't contacted me since. He did apologize to me one day on campus last semester when we ran into each other and I was actually willing to accept it and move on. Until recently. So here I am two years later and everything that happened with Ron has come back up again. I found out recently that he has a history of doing this to other women, like an extensive history going back at least five years. I met another victim of his who he stalked before coming to my university. She had gone to community college for a bit, and he did this to her while he was also a student there. He followed her to our university after apparently being suspended from the school after three incidents that were linked to him. The victim that I met told me something worrying. Ron is currently an RA on our campus, and she was one of his residents. When she told the residential office that Ron had stalked her in the past, they told her that all they could do was have her move dorms, and which she did. They then said that they couldn't do anything to discipline him, because the stalking didn't occur at our university. She and I both reported our experiences with him to the residential office, who then tipped off the campus police, who then spoke to the dean of students. The thing is though, when I gave his name to the residential office, they had no idea who I was talking about. He had given me a fake first and last name, and I had to do a lot of searching to find out his real name. I knew that he was sketchy when I saw the four separate IDs in his wallet but I didn't ever think he had given me a fake name when I had met him. After talking to residential living, I talked to the police. When I talked to police, they didn't seem to care about what I had to say. Actually, the officer that I spoke to talked over me while I was explaining the times that he followed me and said that he had heard all he needed to hear. I spoke to the dean of students, who asked me some clarifying questions about the police report that he had received. The police had mixed up several details of my story with these stories of other victims. Apparently, more people than just myself and the girl that I met have come forward with information about this person. There are even reports that he got physical with two separate people before coming to the university. Last week, I saw him on campus. He's still an RA, even though multiple women have spoken to higher-ups about his behavior. If I hear from him... I'm issuing a no contact order to ensure that he stays away from me. Right now though that feels like too much of a hassle because we're all going home for a two month break. Yeah that's kind of it. It's anticlimactic and there's no sense of justice in all of this. But hopefully this story teaches you all to stand your toes and not to think you're overreacting when someone is being sketchy.